Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the monthly meet, uh, monthly work session of the East Rockaway Board of Education. Uh, I'd like to start this meeting at 7:11. At this time, uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so at this time, Mrs. Springer, the budget, budget hearing. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the budget hearing. Um, this year, we're going to do it a little different. We have some more categories that we don't typically discuss. Um, we, as an administrative team and board of education, felt that um, we should go do a little bit more detail um, than we have in the past. I'm not going to read the topics because we're going to cover them all. So, what I want to first cover is what do we do, what do we consider when we're preparing the budget? You know, everybody always thinks it's just the money, but it really isn't. Um, we look at four key areas. Um, the strategic plan, as we all know, we've talked about that many times. That is always, um, you know, the, the core to our uh, budgeting practice and all the things we do here in East Rockaway. Um, we're looking at the social emotional learning for our students. Um, academics improvements, and of course, long-term financial planning. All of that goes into our budgeting process. So I'm going to hand this over to the superintendent. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Mrs. Creel. So um, before I get into the uh, strategic plan, I'd like to talk about a slide that our staff is incredibly familiar with. And it really talks about our values and priorities. And as you can see the statement up there, what really drives us. And at the center of everything is kids first. All the decisions that we make are based on what's best for our kids. Now you might be asking, how do these four categories on the outside relate to the strategic, to the strategic plan? Quite simply, uh, you're going to hear me talk a little bit about uh, 21st century learning and Mr. Murray go into a little bit more detail on how we're addressing 21st century learning because we feel you know, there are areas that we need to improve in and with 21st century learning, why not use the best practices that are out there? So I'll be mentioning a few of those things. Commitment to continuous learning uh, with our uh, recent uh, reinvigoration, I call, of our professional development uh, through our committees and working with the staff. Uh, we have a great uh, group of teachers and administrators who want to continuously learn and continuously provide the best education we have. So that is in the form of opportunities. And the power of feedback is really, you know, connected to connections. There's feedback going back and forth from the teachers to the students, from teachers to teachers now, and what we call our PLCs. Then we have, you know, feedback going back and forth from our administrators to our teachers. And quite honestly, on Superintendent's Day, I shared, uh, I, I put forth a survey on how I'm doing to the staff, and I shared that with them openly in ways how I can improve and things that I can do for the district. So these are our values, and these are absolutely connected to the strategic plan in so many different ways. So I'm going to take a few minutes to, to address the strategic plan. So the process was very similar, uh, and uh, Ms. Le uh, Lisa Ruiz gets credit for when she came to the district, started the strategic plan. And the process we use this time is very familiar. And uh, what she was able to do, we were able to work on it together. She was able to hand it off to me. And we were able to get it uh, approved in what we think is an outstanding plan. Now, the plan was similar in the sense that we had uh, stakeholders involved, including central administration, building administration, parents, teachers. We had a few students on the committee. And we were able to really piggyback on what we had already established and fine tune it for the next five years. So, uh, as you can see, uh, you know, the, the, the four pillars remain the same. And, you know, we plan and identify key district goals to guide the decision making and resource allocation for the next five years. So, what that's saying is connected to the budget, the strategic plan gives us the way in which we're going to support our students in every single way. And the four major pillars did not change. We felt they're very important, and I'll talk about them in a few minutes. Opportunity, achievement, connection, and innovation. And the focus areas 
provide guidance, leadership, and policy decisions, as well as develop initiatives and strat strategies to achieve our vision. So without further ado, let me talk a little bit about that. So if I talk about achievement, I'm going to start by, I'm just going to restate the goal and the desired outcome and talk about how we're addressing that. So the goal for achievement is to provide an outstanding educational programs for all students to succeed. Our outcome, the East Rockway School District will increase achievement of all students by creating an engaging and inclusive learning environment that successfully balances curriculum, expectations, and pedagogy that reflect 21st century learning. And I say now 21st century learning and beyond, because we're well into the 21st century, but we want to adopt practices that go beyond. So uh, one of our major initiatives that I've been talking about for two years uh, since I was in Mr. Murray's position as the assistant superintendent for curriculum was project-based learning. Not only is the Board of Regents looking to change, not necessarily get rid of the Regents, but add a different practice of assessment, uh, they're leaning toward project-based learning. As I mentioned at previous meetings, I want my staff and my teachers and my students to be prepared in that environment. And what project-based learning does is gives us the essential skills necessary to be successful anywhere. Teamwork, collaboration, problem solving, uh, uh, problem solving, uh, as well as um, for a second. Uh, problem solving, oh, and critical thinking. So those are the skill areas or the essential skill areas that project-based learning will bring to us. In addition, we're shifting to a different assessment tool called iReady. Uh, we feel like, you know, the NWEA is at the point where uh, it's not giving us what we need really to assess and evaluate our students. Uh, we set up a program last year to pilot it with our uh, teaching assistants. And not only did the students love it, the staff loved it. And what really sold me is that the teachers were asking for it. And it's really a, pres a prescriptive method for ELA and math to really drive down and differentiate instruction to students on an individual, for every single individual. So we're really excited about those two initiatives. Flexible furniture I have up there, it's something that we're continuing uh, to foster. Uh, this year, we're moving flexible furniture in the elementary schools to some of the fourth grade and sixth grade classrooms. It's been a tremendous success. All you have to do is walk into one of those classrooms and see the smiles on those kids' faces and the teachers, and you will know that it's a success. And also in the high school, we're also uh, putting together furniture for students to collaborate and work in groups. The idea behind flexible furniture is that we are no longer, you know, working, you know, in the real world in rows and columns and in, uh, in, in, in without communicating. If you look at a, you know, a Google workplace or uh, Amazon, you will see them working and collaborating in groups and working in teams. And that's one of the skills that I want to provide for our kids. And flexible furniture makes it conducive to learning. Uh, and last but not least in the achievement area, uh, this is our first year having a hired full-time literacy coach. She has done wonders at the elementary school. She's built a foundation to scope and sequences for our classroom teachers. And she was able to meld our wonders program into our philosophy. So um, not only has she been building that, she's been modeling lessons in the classroom for our teachers, and she is an excellent resource to have and a very important position in this district to help our elementary school kids move forward. And as we know, the better prepared our elementary school kids are, the more success we will see in the secondary uh, and the middle school. Uh, next pillar, opportunity. Oops. Opportunity, perfect. Okay, so the goal is to uh, ensure success for every student. The desired outcome, East Rockwood School District will increase opportunities that foster academic achievement, self-determination, and social-emotional wellness for all students. But we focus a little bit on what we've been doing uh, uh, social-emotionally. So at the high school, we have a program uh, that started last year at the end of the year called, called Sources of Strength. It's a program where students and teachers volunteer. Uh, uh, and as I mentioned, he's getting in further detail. Uh, Mr. Healy will be uh, giving more details about the program. But that's one of the programs we're excited about at the high school. Um, our ruler program is, in, is taken off in our elementary school. 
Uh, it's based on the Yale Center of Emotional Intelligence uh, with uh, Mark Brackett. We previously, back, I'm going to say, in 2010-11, started introducing the program. Uh, when we had a change of administration, uh, the program didn't take root, but right now, we're very excited how it's taking root in the elementary schools, uh, which is the biggest one in this uh, county. <laughs> Second step. Uh, is an additional and a third social-emotional program for our students. It's a push-in K-8 through eight program uh, where school support uh, uh, staff and they discuss is such issues such as conflict resolution and peer pressure. And uh, we're excited that these three programs within the classroom on the first level will be helping our students uh, deal with all the, all the social-emotional issues that may come, come up uh, in their lives. Last but not least, uh, two additional items, uh, our support staff, we made some changes. Uh, Mr. Healy will be getting into that, but essentially we put two full-time uh, full social workers in each building, shifted some responsibilities for the social workers, and as you know, as I mentioned at the last two meetings, you know, we are, um, are able to, uh, to uh, keep this mantle in the staff up at the high school. So uh, our social-emotional plans are incredibly solid. Uh, and as far as achievement and opportunity, uh, Mr. Murray will be talking about our new course offerings. But what I'd like to mention are two things that we started off with last year was our AP Capstone program. Uh, next year, students will be eligible for the program. Students need to take a course in AP Seminar, which is this year we have two full 10th two full, uh, grade English classes. Next year, we have one populated research course. Those students who score three or more on those two courses and three or more on four AP exams get an AP capstone diploma, which is an incredible distinction for students to achieve. Uh, and last but not least, uh, our Nassau Community Program, uh, we had some, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, we can oh, hear me. Our Nassau Community Program has taken off. Uh, our dual enrollment program allows students to not only earn high school diploma in their senior year, but they can also gain um, an associate's degree and earn credits toward uh, Nassau community. And also, you know, I do want to mention too that we are incredibly supportive of our BOCES programs, and through the years we've increased, you know, the number of students who attend BOCES. So these are all the opportunities for our students uh, to succeed. Next pillar, innovation. So the goal for innovation is to reimagine district resources to enhance the educational experience, okay? So our desired outcome, the East Rockaway School District will continuously design innovative approaches to enhance teaching and learning in a safe, supportive, and inclusive environment. I'd like to start off with safety and inform the public that we're continuously monitoring security for our infrastructure, which is incredibly important. We don't want to be hacked. We don't want our information uh, to be in jeopardy. So what are some of the protocols we have uh, in terms of checks and balances? Uh, we have Outlook scans in which our Outlook emails are continuously scanned and updated for potential viruses, and which we will be rolling out to the teachers is a multifunctional, authentic code. Which, which, for your purposes, it's, uh, you know, when you um, apply for something, you have to, to get verification, you need to enter a code. The administrators are already doing that with some of our accounts. Now we're going to be bringing that to the teachers as an extra layer of security. Um, some of the products and partnerships that focus on 21st century learning. Uh, we're moving in a direction toward Canva, which is a creation tool. It's a perfect match for PBL, and that's something we'll be rolling out in September. Um, our iReady program, which I already spoke about, which we're excited about, okay, that, that's an innovative program that is, uh, will differentiate, differentiate instruction for our students. It will require minimal training in terms of technology for our staff, and that's a big plus to the program. Um, and, and just so you know, uh, our strategy in terms of uh, what programs we're utilizing and what programs we are going to move forward with. We evaluate the usage of each of our programs. If the, the programs aren't being utilized, yes, we are cutting them, but we are reallocating those resources to more valuable 
uh, and to updated 21st century skills. So we're not just you know cutting programs and removing them, but we're reallocating that money to make sure for programs like iReady and, and PDO. And last but not least, on the agenda <coughs> under the guise of Engage All Families, this fall uh, we're going to be planning an educational technology fair, uh, which will include breakout sessions for various topics, including the parent portal, uh, class link, uh, internet safety, and social media use. This was based on last year's program. Uh, uh, in transparency, we wanted to uh, have that program this year, but we felt it would be better to start it off in September uh, at the start of the school year. So we'll be notifying the community and the district of what our technology fair will be looking And the last pillar is uh, connection. The goal is to foster connections that will support every student to become healthy, oops, thank you, to become healthy, fulfilled, and contributing members of society. What is our outcome? The East Rockaway School District will provide every student with rigorous and meaningful learning experience through connections forged with, within each of our schools, across our expanding network of alumni and mentors, and our local and global communities. So um, we've established a few new traditions uh, this year in, in the area of connection. We had our first full uh, career day and I believe, as Mr. Volpus can attest to, uh, was an, an incredible success in which we bring in different careers. Uh, our students select those careers, and they go through a full day selecting the careers that they're interested in. And they have an opportunity to find out what it's about, ask questions. And uh, we were able to also sponsor a lunch, thanks to the PTA, for our seniors to eat lunch with our representatives and to really spend some time with them and ask questions. And we're already seeing some of the positive results of that. Uh, in addition to that, a future fair uh, was uh, a future fair was following the career day, which addressed um, some of the trade schools and our military. So we provided opportunities and connections outside of the district for all of our kids to get to learn and experience careers to try and help them with their future. Um, also, I'd like to mention uh, uh, our, we're part of the BOCES Diversity Fair. In which we recruit, we recruit more culturally, culturally and ethnically diverse candidates, and, and that annual fair took place uh, that Mr. Murray uh, and I attended over the winter. We had 46 applicants, so it was it was um, a good opportunity uh, to have people who are interested in working in Rockaway. So our community organizations, um, we reinvigorated our relationship with the historical society. I'm very proud to say that our fourth graders will be taking the trip uh, to the uh, grist mill. And not only will they be taking that trip to the grist mill, um, they'll be actually uh, getting a hands-on experience there. So uh, we met with the Historical Society. I happened to spend the Saturday there with them. Incredible people have a lot to offer, a lot of history in terms of East Rockwood. So I, I know our kids are going to be benefit, benefiting from that. I'm hoping to expand that relationship. Um, some other organizations that were, you know, um, have been supporting us and making connections for our students, you know, uh, the Kiwanis Club. Uh, the Village Hall, uh, the Ed Foundation, we've been supportive in terms of grants, uh, and, and not only that, helping us support our curriculum with various uh, items. It could be a, a 3D printer, it could be uh, supplies for a gardening club. So the Ed Foundation has been very supportive of, of us, as well as the American Legion. Uh, the American Legion also provides scholarships and educational opportunities, uh, Pearl Harbor Day, uh, Memorial Day Parade and a number of uh, different activities that um, uh, that make connections for our students. So I'm incredibly proud of the strategic plan and I wanted the community to know how it connects to what we do. So those are the areas that um, that I wanted, you know, the highlights. If you, if you have any interest, please call me if there are any other questions you have about that. And also I want to point you to the website, our points of pride list by different schools, central office, elementary, and secondary district, some of the initiatives, some of the things that we're already running, and some of the things that we're incredibly proud of. So you can, all you have to do is click on the page, look at our points of pride, and uh, we'd be glad to share that information with you. Okay, at this point, yeah, we'll turn it over to Mr. Healy. And I'm gonna speak about a number of instructional positions that were previously grant funded or new this year that are being uh, rolled into the budget that's to the tireless efforts of Ms. Scrio. 
Um, the first is the elementary special education position. Uh, over the last few years, our needs have increased uh, for, our, for our students with disabilities. And so it became necessary to add a full-time position at the elementary school for a special education teacher. Um, the next position is the uh, school counselor position, which is uh, Ms. Mantle's position, which has also been absorbed into the budget, uh, which is previously grant funded. Uh, in addition, we had a social worker at the high school who had spent a considerable amount of her time, 60% or 0.6, uh, doing action research and writing a grant. That was time away from kids, and ultimately the cost to benefit ratio did not benefit the district any longer. And so we believe that social worker of that grant writing responsibility, consequently she now has more than half of her schedule of time to meet with uh, our students. Uh, one just small typo on this slide is that uh, the 0.5 board certified behavior analyst or BCBA position is actually a new position this year. Uh, we have hired a speech and language therapist previously who uh, does have her, her BCBA certification and um, had, you know, we have been doing having her take a look at some of our students with behavioral needs at Green Avenue School. Ultimately, uh, we decided to move away from contract work, which is typically where our BCBA services come from, an outside contractor, and to move those services in-house by uh, expanding that teacher's role. So now that person is in the building full-time, we've had a crisis, and also is able to collaborate with the principal more readily on uh, building-wide behavior interventions. Uh, touching on our social-emotional uh, supports, uh, as Mr. DiTomaso had said, ruler approach is now in year two. Uh, it had been previously brought into the district and ultimately abandoned at some point. Uh, I have to give uh, Principal Kelly all the credit in the world. She pushed very hard for ruler. She used it in a previous position uh, in the DOE. Um, and what we've been doing this year is I've been working with principals on our staff-wide rollout, we've been training our teachers, and beginning in September, the teachers will then funnel down to uh, the students. So this is all in line with the, the rollout approach that Ruler advises. Um, and so uh, what we're hopeful is that we'll have some sort of a morning meeting at the elementary schools. Uh, students will have an opportunity to check in. They'll be able to sit in their emotions, recognize their emotions, and more proactively address their emotions throughout the school day. Uh, it also gives teachers a heads up which students might be struggling that day, and then those uh, students can get more immediate support. Uh, source of strength is also in year two. Mr. Kennedy has taken the lead on that. He's done a fantastic job this year. Uh, they've recruited 30 new students into the program, as well as several new teachers. Um, they'll be having the second part of their training uh, latest month, we have the second, and they'll be launching uh, a campaign this year. Source of strength is about launching campaigns of positivity and inclusiveness in the school. And so the point is to get students to identify what they feel is a need, how they can bring people together for the students to really uh, lead the charge of that, and the teachers just sort of act as a support and mentor uh, for those campaigns. Uh, as I said, the full-time BCBA support is at Rame Avenue. Um, obviously, we have other buildings where we have behavioral needs, and we now have that support person who can also advise or, if necessary, visit those other buildings to lend that support. And then, uh, Mr. Chief Master touched on this uh, previously, but we reconfigured our social work crisis. So previously, we had had three social workers at the junior senior high school and one social worker who was split between the two elementary schools. This year was we, uh, as we relieved that one social worker of grant writing responsibilities, um, we freed up her time, and then we were able to move one of the social workers from the junior senior high school down to uh, Grand Avenue School, where that person is now full time. The person who has split between two uh, elementary schools is now full time at Center Avenue. And so you have a more proactive approach to the social emotional needs of our youngest uh, kids. And um, what we're finding so far uh, is that it's, you know, according to teachers, administrators, and the social workers themselves, is that it has a very moral experience for our kids. Um, they're getting their social emotional needs met more uh, proactively and at a younger age. And uh, we're hopeful that in the years that follow, what we're going to see is fewer needs at the high school um, because the needs are being addressed more proactively. And our kids are, are more um, healthy socially and emotionally. So, that. Thank you.
So I have the, I think, one of the more fun jobs in the district because I get to take the, the funds that Superintendent Ms. Freer and the board work so hard to, um, to budget for and put them into use in the classrooms. And I always like to really go back to our mission. And, uh, Mr. DiTomaso was talking about our strategic plan, but you also have a mission statement that, that is time honored. And when I am working with our staff, with our administrators, our teachers to make these curricular and instructional decisions, I really want to focus on making sure that they engage every learner, they're bringing innovative practices to our classroom, they're challenging our students, and help them become more self-directed and creative so they are ready for the future. Um, one of those uh, elements that the district supported starting this year and moving forward is a full-time literacy coach at the elementary schools. Um, she has really done tremendous things with our teachers and our administrators. Uh, our Wonders Literacy Program had some conflicts with our balanced literacy framework that we believed in both, and she worked to make them work together really in a tremendous seamless way for our students where they're having that workshop model in the classroom, more small group instruction, more individualized learning. Um, she has also put student data at the forefront of all of those conversations with our teachers and our administrators and made sure that the decisions that we're making at the district level, the building level, the classroom level, they're all based on actual student data and performance needs. Um, and our teachers are also getting better because she's in the classroom modeling best practices, having conversations with them, giving feedback, answering questions, and making sure that our classrooms are at the pinnacle of what good instruction looks like at the elementary level. I, I want to add one thing. Uh, she's also impacted parents at parent-teacher conferences. Uh, she went through our library, a period of library books, divided them up by ability level and grade level, and provided those resources for parents at parent-teacher conferences, which in my opinion is so valuable, not just to see the grades, but to have a way to help them improve. So those are just some of the things I forgot to mention, I wanted to mention that before. But those are some of the things that the literacy coach is doing to help us, you know, improve, improve in areas that we know we need to improve. So Mr. Dichmas was giving a preview of the elementary update that will take place on the 23rd. So you can come back for more. Um, another piece that we're going to be beginning next year, and we have already started working out the details with PBL Works, is project-based learning staff development for our teachers. And when our teachers have a full understanding of how to teach in a project-based learning classroom, our students are the ones who really benefit because they will take the time on extended uh, investigations. Through those investigations, they learn, they gain knowledge, they gain skills, they become future ready because they learn how to learn. They are authentic problems and challenges. They're, they're real life, real world issues that the students bring up so they have their passion, they have their interest level. Um, and that at the end of that, they need to demonstrate what they've learned in some public setting. It's not just handing a paper to the teacher. It's actually perhaps it's the middle school students coming down to third grade and teaching them about the water cycle that they learned pollution here in, in the bays. Or our seniors visit our seventh graders and they tell them about uh, what it means to be an engaged citizen in voting. Whatever it might be, um, it's a real demonstration of that learning. And it enhances all of those 21st century skills or essential skills of communication, collaboration, uh, creativity, and critical thinking that are so important for our students as they graduate. Uh, another program we're really excited about, and, and Mr. Gitmasa mentioned already, is iReady. iReady is um, a platform that actually does a lot of things at its most basic level. It is our universal screener that will replace the NWEA test uh, for the mandated K-8 reading and math testing that's required by federal education law. Um, but that is only the beginning of that program because what it does that NWEA does not is it takes that student data and turns it into um, proposed lessons for the students that they can then do self-paced on the computer and they love that experience because it's at their level. 
It will also send teachers to specific lessons, ideas, and resources to help them use in the classrooms at, at a whole group level or a small group level, and that is something that MG, NWA does not do as well. Um, so uh, we're really excited about that, and the fact that it's linked directly to New York State standards as opposed to a generic national norm well, it is going to hopefully make this program even better for having our teachers improve their daily instruction. Some of our students still struggle to read, and we are bringing bring them back a program the district had many years ago called Read 180. Um, it is designed for our most some of our most needy students. The program has been redesigned over the last few years. It's one of the only reading intervention programs that the National Association of Special Education Leaders approves of. It's also won uh, best tech tools as far as how it incorporates technology with the learning. And I know our reading teachers are really excited about this because they know the old program and know how much better it is. And when our students actually see it, I think they're gonna be excited as well. I've seen it work in other districts and students enjoy being in this program because they feel success and they can actually see themselves growing from week to week. At the high school, we're really excited about some of the course offerings that we're going to be able to expand. Uh, we're adding a financial algebra course next year, and this came from wanting to give our students who wanted to do advanced math more pathways than the traditional algebra 2 trigonometry class, which isn't for everybody's interest, but some students still want to do advanced math. So the financial algebra course will allow that. It'll blend some of Algebra 2 with some pre-calculus and really set students up to take advanced math courses without going on a traditional pre-calc -calc pathway. Set them up for statistics and set them up perhaps other advanced math courses we can build over the next few years. The AP Capstone program is going to be coming to fruition next year as we add AP research. It becomes the second course in a two-year sequence for students who are interested in pursuing the capstone diploma, which is a really nice feather in the cap for them when they go looking to apply to colleges. And as Mr. DiTomaso said, if they do well on several other exams also, they can earn a capstone diploma. They can earn a capstone diploma with distinction. There are different levels of that capstone honor that they can bring with them as they go off to college. Not to mention all the credits they earn from doing well in the exams that they can go to college as a second semester freshman or even a sophomore. And then as our community has uh, more families coming in that are native Spanish speakers, we realized that our traditional Spanish courses were not meeting all of their needs. So we're adding a Spanish free heritage class. So students who speak Spanish at home already and are fluent orally in the language will be able to take Spanish 3 with more of a focus on literacy and literature and expand their reading and writing capacity and um, take the knowledge of the language they already have and really become fluent as a reader and writer. Uh, it will still align with the flax checkpoint B exam, so they're still taking that same test that all of the students taking Spanish will take to earn their um, foreign language credit, but it'll help them feel more connected to the course than they necessarily do now. Um, and all of these things are all designed to help support 21st century skills and looking beyond the content and really developing students who know how to learn, not what to learn. It's so important for our students to grow the world with skills more than knowledge. Our cell phones and our Google searches and now AI can give us the knowledge. How do you use those tools responsibly? That's what these programs let us do. And we're gonna have students who are ready for their future, whatever that future is. And Ms. Rio will go into the details. So the last area that we, um, we take into consideration when we're planning for the upcoming budget and for future years um, is our long-term financial goal. So that's a key part of any uh, future success in any industry, especially here in um, public schools. So this course is something that some people have listened to me talk about for many, many, many years. Um, 
we set goals. When I first got here in 2016, uh, one of the first things that I felt we needed to um, address was the dependency on using reserves to bridge the gap uh, between uh, other revenues and the expenditures. And so we put a lot of focus into um, removing our dependency on capital reserves. So we used to rely on our capital reserves to cover any uh, annual capital projects or any maintenance in the building. And that really is a general operating expense and should be in our general budget. So we did eliminate that rather quickly, maybe over the first two or three years. Um, so now all of our annual small capital projects, you don't want our big projects because they do need to fund, but our small projects we can do annually and make sure that we don't get to a situation where we need very large bond projects or we're in a situation where we need emergency repairs. Um, and then plant maintenance should be kept, should maintain our plant, um, our facilities regularly um, and not wait until uh, they get to a point where it's, it's important or an emergency again. So now we have annual plant maintenance and that is inside the budget and we maintain our plant. So uh, we're proud of that. The other area in which we were dependent on reserves for was technology. Now, all of our hardware was funded through the technology reserves. Um, years ago, technology um, wasn't such an important part of uh, the instructional program. We all know that that has changed. We are glad that we shifted well before uh, COVID. Um, and what we've done is we've started to reduce our dependency on the capital reserves for technology. Uh, uh, we had planned on removing our dependency completely in 2021, but unfortunately with COVID, we actually sped up um, the technology we brought to our students and we increased in, uh, the one-to-one -one devices. So we went a little faster than we had anticipated, but over the few over the past several years, we've built a hardware technology replacement plan. Uh, we expand on it annually, and we discuss that in our February uh, work session to make sure that we're aware of what's coming, so we don't ever have outdated computers um, in our uh, classrooms, and that we are able to support technology and replace technology and keep up with technology in our operating budget without to be uh, dependent on these errors. And so we are really close. I had hoped to be completely off of it this year. Um, right now we're using $70,000. Um, I am confident we will not use that $70,000. Um, and in the following budget year, we will be completely off of these errors as well. Um, so that would be a check mark. Right now it's a little box. Um, so over the past, Six years, we reduced our dependency on using reserves to uh, bridge the funding gap by $1.36 million. That is huge. When you look at our annual increases and our tax levy increases, it, you would never know that in a budget of $43 million, that a million dollars has been removed and shifted. So I think that is a, a good achievement on behalf of this Board of Education and Administration. Um, and I changed this. This is just a little chart. I think this really demonstrates at where we started and where we are now. And next year, I expect it to be completely down to zero. Another area that we've talked about and how often discussed is fund balance. Now, what is fund balance? Fund balance is when you have um, Revenues received in excess of the amount you estimated and expenditures that are below the total amount of appropriation. Now, a budget is a budget. It's just that. It's an estimate. So we can do the best we can coming up with ideas in January and February as to what costs will be the following year. But there are estimates. Some go down, some go up. We spend our entire year looking at our numbers and making sure that we are purchasing um, supplies and uh, services in the best manner. And that if there's something that we may have budgeted for, that maybe we could get in a less expensive way, or maybe we don't need it after all, we don't spend it. That money's just held. We don't just shift the money for other expenditures because it's in the budget. Um, it's important to have a fund balance. Um, it can be used for unexpected expenses and shortfalls of revenue. Last year, we had um, an unexpected 
increase of our flood insurance. We got told on June of 20, June 29th that we could expect an additional $200,000 of flood insurance. These are the kinds of things that fund balance comes in. We've had um, water main breaks here. We've had pipes underneath the, the building, under the basement. We've had major leaks that we didn't know were occurring because they were under the building and there was no sign of leaks. So we got hit with major water bills on top of the repair. It was the water bills that made us realize we had a problem. And then we had to find it in us underneath the building, which was not a cheap repair. Never once over the several years that we've had this problem have we ever come back to the community, to the Board of Education, and said, we need to increase our expenditure budget. We have always been able to cover these costs without any impact. And I think that is important. Also, when you go out the Moody's rating, which we do go out when we are uh, borrowing, it's important to have fund balance. If your fund balance gets too low, it may be within the guidelines, 4%, but if it gets too low, Moody's considers that a risk. Why is that important? Well, when we borrow, it's important to have a good Moody's rating. We had our ratings increase a couple of years ago. It maintains there. Um, they, we had another um, review last year when I did bond borrowing. We were so close to being upgraded again. Um, and we're hoping that in the future we will get it upgraded again. And again, they mentioned in their report that our conservative budget, budgeting and our fund balance is a significant um, reason for our strong um, financial rating for a small little district like this. It also can be used as a funding source. And you often see that it happens here in East Rockaway to reduce the tax levy that um, we set on the taxpayers. Last, let's see, 2122, we had a $2 million fund balance. We came out to the voters in November of 21. Uh, we had a significant fund balance due to COVID in 1920. Um, we shut down for three months. That money, spending was frozen. Money was not spent. And that money was held. Because the 2021 budget, which was a very difficult budget to build, um, being in the middle of a pandemic, when the New York State budget was adopted, it had a clause in there that they gave them three look back periods in which they could go back, look at the revenue coming into New York State, and depending on their level of revenue, they could withhold and reduce um, state aid coming to school districts. That was a very scary time for us. Because the first time in a long time, we were looking at possible media cuts. We haven't seen that in 20, 25 years. We haven't seen that. No one ever seen that. So we prepared for that. When we got through that year and they didn't do any cuts, we held on to that fund balance. And we decided, as an administrative team, Board of Education, that the best use of that money would be to expand the ventilation in both of the two elementary buildings because we had done a complete renovation of the ventilation in the high school as part of the bond project, but in our two elementary buildings, it was only partially completed. We were not doing the entire building. So we felt, based on the pandemic and what we had just gone through, that the best use of that money that we saved because of the pandemic was to utilize it to make sure our ventilation was operating in all three of our buildings. Put a vote out in November of 21, community overwhelmingly improved it and that fund balance was moved to the capital to fund those additional projects which will be taking place this summer um so here is fund balance that we use as a reserve as a revenue source so every year we do have an excess amount of money um and we return it. we put some of it into reserves and we return a, a portion of it to the tax base annually to reduce the level. And for many years, we were given $760,000. It was kind of a number that we had decided in the district was a good number, and we just did it regularly. As we continued to reduce our dependency on reserves, we decided to take a closer look at fund balance and see what can we do with the fund balance to bring that level down a little bit. We now we're in good control of our reserves. Let's look at our fund balance. So we started to increase the amount of money we gave back to the taxpayers, keep the taxpayers levy low. You can see it went up to $1.1 million. The 
following year, last year, or the current year, $1.3 million. And as we are increasing that, we're also decreasing and tightening our budget. Right? And to make the fund balance, what we feel a controlled, slow uh, tightening is the, is the right way to budget, not a quick pull off the band aid. You never know what's coming next year. And, and it has kept us in a very good situation. Now I will show that, how we are with our tax levies and where we could have been had we not been watching the budget closely. So now we're going down to uh, a little over a million dollars. Um, we anticipate the fund balance this year will be less than it was last year, and we will continue to reduce that. But you must remember, when you have less left over, you have less to give. So we have to bring them down at the same time. You can't just rip a Band-Aid off and say, we got $2 million, let's give it back to the taxpayers. Because next year, you have a $2 million hole in your revenue source. You have to really take it. It sounds easy to just give it back, but honestly, it's a long-term process and it has to be done carefully. And I think this district, the Board of Education, has done a good job here. Another area that we look at is our budget growth. Something we've talked about uh, many times during budget uh, sessions. We want to control our annual budget to budget increases. That's also very important. Um, what I did here is I showed you the CPI increases compared to the district's budget to budget increases. And you see the first budget, and I started with the year that I, my first budget here um, in the school district. And my first budget, you'll see the I don't know if it's like an orange color. Um, the CPI was was higher um, than the budget to budget. The budget to budget actually went down. We cut the budget. Um, I felt that there were some areas that could be reduced that we made, but we actually proposed a lower budget the first year. The second year, you see, we're slightly higher. Again, here you go. You go, you go very low one year, and it kind of impacts you the next year. So we were trying to level that off, and you can see we're very close. The CPI and budget to budget for the next three years. Now that I got a good handle, Board of Education Administration, we really understand where we are. It takes a long time to understand the budget. It's not a simple task. There's several hundred, if not a thousand, different codes that have to be monitored. And you would think, well, you know, you have codes, you get used to them. You know, then the state decides everything has to be done and broken down by buildings. So the codes all have to be expanded. So it, it really is a balancing act. Get a really good handle on it. You see last year, the current budget, you see what the CPI is compared to where our budget to budget growth is. And that was because we began to start decreasing and tightening our budget to lower the fund balance. And that's why you see we used some of that money that was in the budget to keep our budget to budget growth low and to keep our tax level. This year, look at the major difference. Again, we're tightening the budget, again, slowly. We've said it multiple times, we're not doing anything quick. We're going slowly to make sure that we can prepare for the upcoming unknowns. And there are unknowns. Nobody predicted COVID. It just, nobody predicted the oil prices, the electricity prices to go to the road. There are many things that have hit us that we did not forget. And that's why we have to be very careful when we start to reduce fund balance. So now let's talk about the budget, which is what we're really looking for. So here's a budget timeline. Uh, we began the process back in the fall. We had four public work sessions, and we adopted in April, and we will vote next Tuesday. All of the budget's presentations are recorded. PowerPoints are on the website. Um, and I urge you to please go and watch them, read the PowerPoints, and please ask questions. We're always here to address any concerns you have. Um, and here is our budget. So it is a 3.15% increase, so $1.3 million overall. In this budget, we have reduced, we have the federal stimulus funding that is expiring. We took 2.6, well, we actually took two positions from the federal stimulus funding that we knew were expiring, and the goal when we did the federal stimulus, that these positions were short term. Everybody was hired, everybody was told short term that it's a two year funding. We decided that two of those positions 
need to be continued, so we brought them into the general fund. In addition, the point six, which was funded by another grant, was brought in. We, got, we decided the grant money wasn't worth it, so that is also in here. With a 3.15% increase and over 8% CPI. This is our three part budget. Um, it breaks it down by categories uh, program, capital, and administrative, and they always shift, give or take, one or two percent. Um, our capital went down this year because a debt service went down. I anticipate debt service will go up slightly next year because the bond will be borrowed next year for the final phases of the budget of the bond. This is a breakdown. It shows you the various components and it shows you where the changes, increases, and decreases were. Here I have broken down exactly what is administrative component um, and where why we have an increase. Um, again, I talk about the uh, flood and cyber insurance. Basically, it's the flood insurance that has really hit us hard. We're located in an area that um, got hit very hard by Super Storm Sandy. And there was a lot of uh, flooding around the country and all of the insurances have gone up drastically. We have um, asked and written a strong letter to try to get us a waiver. Um, we've yet to hear, but if we do hear, that'll be another savings to the district. But right now we have to budget for what we anticipate. Um, in addition, this covers any Board of Education expenses, all of central office and building administration, <coughs> district-wide clerical staff, uh, all of the business office operations, all of our insurances, auditing, legal, and our district club. So it is a lot more than what it appears to sound like. Um, and it is $5.4 million. The next component, which is the largest component of the three-part budget is our uh, program. And that is our instructional staff, our entire instructional staff, our social workers, as you can see, health services, transportation, athletics, co-curriculum, this area um, has a the most increase. It does have 3.1 um, additional positions, the 2.6 coming from grants, and at 0.5 um, that we increased. Was it BCBA? Is that what it is? Okay, let's make sure I got it right. Um, additionally, we have um, tuition for three charter school students here. Um, that's relatively new to the school district. Our uh, charter school tuition rate is set by New York State Education Department. It is set by the actuals. It is not set by the budget. It is set by the actuals. So each year when we file our ST3, after the final audit is prepared, um, we file the ST3, which is hundreds and hundreds of pages of financial documents that we must file. Breaks down how our expenditures are, our actual expenditures are spent. Um, and based off of those numbers, the state sets the tuition rate for, for the charter schools. So we do have money in the budget, $60,000 for charter schools. Um, transportation, um, there is an increase. It's based on the May CPI, <coughs> which we should know soon. Um, this year, we did have several students that we were unable to transport. We are legally required to transport students. We could not get bus companies to bid on it. So we did save money, but that's not something we can count on. So this year, many parents were driving their students um, and we were reimbursing the parents, which is a significant savings. And when we had the opportunity, we always try to get them to do that. But most parents would prefer to see their child on a school bus. Um, in this situation, several of them, they were not put on school buses. And we had no choice but to ask the parents to, you know, tell them we have no choice. We can't transport your child. And we have all the documentation. We did multiple bids to try to get it because honestly, we are legally required to transport these, child, these children. So this year, my expense was much lower than I anticipated. But that doesn't mean next year won't be higher. So in case anybody's looking at my financial statements, you'll see that at the end of the year. And then the last part is our capital component. This covers all of our security, um, our custodial and maintenance staff, our operations and maintenance of the building. As I said, our maintenance is now done in the building. 
also, uh, annual projects are now in the building, uh, in the budget annually, and then debt service. Our debt service went down this year. Um, it will go up next year when I do the final borrowing for the bond, but also I, what we do with, um, with bond borrowing and we promised that there would be no impact to the tax base. Actually, I believe there's actually going to be a decrease for the tax payers. So what we have to do is we have to kind of balance it so that when we're going to get our state aid is when our debt service payments start. It's a balancing act because it all depends on if the projects close when they're supposed to close. That doesn't always happen. We know that because our high school project is now five months behind schedule. So, you know, we try very hard to keep these balanced to, to level it out so that the impact to the taxpayers is lower and meet, and we meet what we promised this community. And there is no doubt in my mind that debt service overall, the outlay, the difference between the bond borrowing and the state aid we're receiving is going to be less than where we were with the old bond. So revenue sources. So these are the various areas in which we receive revenue in order to fund our budget. I don't know if I should go through each one of them, but most important, I'll go to the next page, which breaks it down. So here is the revenue analysis, what we're anticipating um, next year and what we budgeted for this year. Uh, and with the state aid numbers, you'll always see a, a change from what is on state aid runs because again it's a budget it's a, it's the state aid is estimating what aid we're getting and it's based a lot on expenditures um this year we are getting a significant increase in the foundation aid which is wonderful but this is it this is the last year again that's another thing that we have to think when we're doing long-term planning next year we are not going to see this kind of an increase so we really have to be very careful about how we build our budget and how tight we make it. Because next year we are going to have increases that are clearly not gonna be anywhere near the increase that we received in foundation aid, yet we still have contractual obligations. We still have increasing costs that we cannot control, such as utilities, transportation, special ed services, and all the contractual obligations of our employees. Um, charges for services, that's like we have some added district students that attend our wonderful special ed programs, so we collect tuition for them. We have health services, um, the students that are in our, in our schools we charge and we collect money for that. Um, a miscellaneous, a pilot where we all know it's payment in lieu of taxes. Um, one of our properties rolled off the, um, I mean, never the name of the property, but one of them rolled off, so went back into our assessed value. So a decrease here actually helps the taxpayers because now they're back on the assessment roll and they're not getting a discounted tax rate. Um, the interest, um, as we all know, interest has gone to the roof. It's gotten much better. Last year, our total interest on general fund monies because the interest that we use as a revenue source is interest on general fund monies. It's not all interest earned. Interest earned on revenue on uh, reserves is obligated to be placed in the reserve accounts. It's not used to offset your budget. So um, we every year when our auditors come in, one of the first things they ask me for is our analysis in which the interest for the reserves was allocated to the reserves. So that is going to keep our reserves funded well. Um, last year we earned thirteen thousand dollars in interest based on our fund balance. Um, this year, we opened up a class investment account. The rate is 4.85% as of this morning. It varies daily. And the rate on our funds varies daily. It's not like a monthly rate. So it's, it's very um, beneficial to the district. We had it many, many years ago. Their old rules were if you didn't keep a certain amount of money in the account, you had to close it. So the district closed it before I got here. And really, we looked into it early in, in when I first started, it really didn't make sense to open it. The rates were so low. Now that the rates have gone up, we have reopened the account. I think we approved it in March, and our money is now invested there, and we are accruing a nice amount of interest. Um, another area um, when I talk about interest is many years ago, 
Uh, we used to borrow money called the tax anticipation note. And we do that every summer, like July or August, because we start the school year in July, but we don't see our tax money until the fall. And we don't see our state aid money until the winter. So we used many districts, including this district, would borrow X amount of money. We paid interest on that money to get us kind of bridge the time between when we, when we have to start paying salaries and expenses and when we start to get our, our tax money and our um, state aid. Um, when I came here, I ended that practice because we had a nice fund balance. We didn't need to, to borrow money. The fund balance that we had could carry us those couple of months. So we've saved a significant amount of money by ending that practice in interest paid. But that has decreased our interest to earn. But they're definitely, uh, we did far better by earning less than we did by paying more. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it was, uh, you know, we had to look at it. It was absolutely beneficial to the school district to take the lower interest and not pay higher interest. That's another area why you'll see our interest is low. Um, I do expect it to be up around 80,000, if not higher. I'm, I'm being optimistic. 80,000 is four times more than what I budgeted last year. I didn't meet that. So I, I think we'll, we'll be at least five times higher. Um, miscellaneous that went over. Appropriated fund balance, appropriated from reserves. I love that dash. We've been working on that for years. No money coming from reserves. Appropriated fund balance, we talked about earlier, going down, and we will be bringing that down. I would um, hope that we would always have a line appropriated fund balance, but it'd be more like what it used to be around 750. is probably a good number for a district with a budget of this size, and that is our tax levy. So talking a little bit about the tax levy cap, it's a the tax levy cap was put back 11 years ago when it's law. Um, it has five different components to it. Four are unique to each district. One is uh, across the board, across the state, and that's the CPI, 2% or lower. We all know CPI was up at 8%. We were allowed to use 2%. Um, over 11 years, I have a graph that shows this is very um, hard to predict. And it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. This is something that we're trying to work with when we're trying to plan the future of the district. If we had looked at the average tax levy cap based on the formula, we could have raised the taxes by 2.19 every single year here in the school district. That's the average annual increase. This year, the levy cap is 1.96. <clears throat> but here's our tax levy. It's 1.83. You see the four arrows? Four out of the past five years, the district has brought a budget to the taxpayers that is below the tax levy cap. The 10-year tax levy average was one is 1.84. That should say 11 years. 1.84. Remember, and I put it there to remind us, but our tax levy cap was 2.19. So the district is definitely fiscally responsible. We are definitely looking at what's best for the taxpayers, but we also have to remember long-term planning and what's best for our students. So we are coming in quite a bit below what we could have. Many districts you'll find will do the cap every single year. That has not been the mindset of this district. At least you can see four out of five years, we've decided that that is not necessary. And at this time, we don't need to do it while maintaining our program and actually improving it. Here is the estimated tax levy by an average homeowner. Um, we get the assessed values. We do not set assessed values here in the school district. It's set um, by Nassau County Assessor's Office. They give the information to us um, based on the information they gave us in April. The average assessed value of a home is 449 I guess, and very well. 449 is the number to give us, you know, how they work that. Um, based on that, the yearly impact for the average uh, says homeowner is $179, $14.92 a month, or 50 cents a day to support this budget. Included in this budget, we have additional propositions. 
Proposition number two is our capital reserve fund for technology projects. This is that extra $70,000 we're using our reserves to um, bridge a gap between what's in the budget and what we need for our technology hardware replacement plan. Again, I'm fully confident this will be the last year you see this proposition on to bridge a gap for the replacement plan. You may have a proposition in the future if we have a large technology project that can't be funded through the general fund. That's what a reserve account should be used for. Proposition three is um, our high school cupola. I wish we could have made that bigger. Um, maybe you can see it over there. It is in disrepair. It is, when you pull in the high school, it really looks bad. You should pull into the high school and take a look at it. Um, when you go up close, the windows are broken, the birds are hanging out. Um, it really needs replacement. Um, so we got a proposal. Um, we're estimating about $313,000. That is a little too much to put inside our budget. Um, so it's going to be pulled from our reserves. Um, of course, we have to get the state approval. We have to go through that whole process. So it would not be done this, this year, probably next year. We have to get approval from the, from the community first before we can go to the state. This is our ballot. I like to show this because there's multiple propositions. Um, on the left-hand side, my first arrow, you'll see proposition one, that's the budget vote. Down on the bottom on the left will be where we uh, vote for our trustees. And then we have proposition two, which is our technology reserve and proposition three, which is our reserve for building improvements for the cupola. So in summary, a budget, to budget increase is 3.15 with a tax impact, levy impact of 1.83. Um, we have two propositions, one for technology to bridge our gap with the um, hardware technology plan. And the third one is to repair the high school cupola. Our vote is Tuesday between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Please remember to vote. Any questions? Oh, we're good. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for a very um, in-depth uh, presentation. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, moving on. Um, review uh, item D. Review minutes of regular board meeting. That would be the April 18th board meeting that we have here. Anyone have any questions on that? No questions. Nope. No. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, subject <clears throat> E information, new business. Is there any? Uh, uh, one, one thing I'd like to mention um, I know that uh, our regular board meetings, our public meetings, um, there was a question about paper copies. Uh, and the detail and maybe uh, not being comfortable uh, using the technology to really get into the details of that. So at uh, future board meetings, we will be um, have a few copies for people uh, if they want to work off the copy as we're going through the meeting. So that's uh, something that I wanted the public you know, to be aware of. It's in transparency. We want you to see the budget and we want you to see the information on the agenda and all the items that are there. So we will be providing that at our next that's it for new business. Okay. All right, great. Uh, next is item F, questions on the next board agenda. That would be the um, May 23rd meeting. We have the agenda right here. Anyone have any questions on that? Okay. I have no question. Okay. Um, okay. Um, any, anyone say anything else? Okay. So, oh, well, we could say yeah. to the Thistle Moor. <laughs> Have you seen our wonderful playground? <laughs> it's center? No. Okay, so when you walk no, out that door, you won't miss it. I will. I, I, I urge everybody. In the back? To, yes, I urge in the back. I didn't look at I didn't look at No, no, go look. Okay, I urge everybody. To, that's our final. Um, our final playground, we were waiting for funding from a grant, which the minute we got the application, a PO went out and it, the work started. I mean, they, we had the vendors waiting. They knew it was coming and we were just waiting for the final sign off 
Um, but it's it's being put up. The children are loving watching the construction. Uh, we considered waiting to the summer, and then we decided what a wonderful thing for the children as long as we could have the children outside safely while the construction was going on, and we could. We worked all that out, thanks to Mr. Daly and Ms. Ms. Kelly. So please, everybody go see it. It is fab it's fabulous. It's we have now completed. Sorry, it's almost ready. It's it looks right. just about by the end of the week. A little cleanup to do, and they're, they're finishing up the third form. That's uh, great. That's great. Thank you. It's actually really impressive how quickly that turf got installed because I was here this morning at about five to eight for a meeting, and they were just raking out the gravel. They hadn't even pounded it yet. I came back for a meeting around eleven. They were pounding the gravel, and at the end of the day. They had already laid about three quarters of the grass down. Like that, whatever team they had was really working today. Awesome. That's great. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone, anything else? Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Um, all right. So I'd like to adjourn this work session of the East Rockaway School Board at eight twenty-one p.m. Uh, good night, everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.